joining us, everyone. Uh, this is one of our NILA lunchtime webinars. We've done a few of them now. Um, this one uh, is going to be on getting more from your NILA data. Uh, and we'll we'll take you through the session. We will be finished by uh, one o'clock today, so there's time for presentation and some questions as well. So just before we start, th there um, we should all be familiar with Zoom now, eh? but uh, submit your questions through the questions tab, and then there's a little uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. If you like a question, you can bump it up uh, with the upvote um, or add your own question there separately. Uh, and we'll, uh, Peter and I will do our best to address those questions at the end. Um, if you're having any trouble with Zoom, uh, like a lot of IT, try turning it off and on again. So exit and restart if you're having any uh, particularly audio problems connecting to the audio. Um, we'll make a recording of this webinar available uh, on the NILA website um, and we'll send out a feedback survey to you afterwards to um, really to, to gauge whether this has been helpful or not um, and any ideas you have for future webinars related to NILA and emergency laparotomy, that's an opportunity to let us know about that. So as I mentioned, our, all of our previous webinars and resources are available uh, on the NILA website. Um, and I'll, I'll post a link for this in the chat. So we've done a few webinars on um, the, the patient pathway, uh, a specific one on uh, the NILA data that came out of COVID. We've done a few on elderly care provision, on uh, sepsis and uh, some on our annual uh, reports as well. So do go on and look at those all on the uh, NILA website, which will take you a link to, uh, to watch those videos. And I'll be posting some resources into the chat uh, later on. So most of what you hear referenced, um, we, we will share with you in other ways as well. <clears throat> so what we're hoping to cover today, this is how to get the best from your NILA data to improve care. Um, as a crucial part of collecting that data is using that data to, um, uh, to help your, to know how you're doing and then to use that information to help your patients in the future. There's an absolute wealth of information out there and I think it's really important that um, you can use that. Um, so we'll go through some key functions on the NILA dashboard. Uh, I'll take you through that. And then um, my colleague today, uh, Peter Martin, is going to talk through some of the of, um, functionality for mortality monitoring and the UMA charts, which are pretty new, although we've had them for a little while now. But I, I think they give us a fantastic opportunity to really understand the risk of the patients that you're looking after and what your mortality data is looking like uh, in real time. So please do ask any questions that you have. Um, we've got an hour today, which I hope will be plenty of time into the Q&A box and we'll address those all at the end. So the panel today, um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Dr. Carolyn Johnson. I'm the, the QI lead for NILA um, and have been for quite a few years now. I'm a consultant anaesthetist at St. George's Hospital in London. And as you can imagine, in my time there, I've been the local NILA lead uh, amongst other things. Um, so I hope that I'll be able to take you through the dashboard today um, in a way that a NILA lead or, or someone looking at NILA data would look at it. And I'm joined, uh, I was uh, uh, joking with him earlier, he's doing our keynote speech today, at Dr. Peter Martin, who's an Associate Professor in Applied Statistics at University College London and um, uh, the Department of Applied uh, Health Research. He uh, works for NILA um, as our statistician, and he also works on the, the PQIP project, which some of you may be involved in as well, uh, another key um, data and improvement project run through the Royal College of Anaesthetists. So I'm going to start us off today to talk about uh, why it's important to look at your data and what the best practice is there. So this is a bulletin article that we published in January 2021. And what we did that year is we looked at our sites that had the lowest risk adjusted mortality. And some of those sites, Stepping Hill Hospital and the Royal Salford, for example, had risk adjusted 30 day mortality of under 3%. So that's really impressive mortality uh, figures. Also from Addenbrooke's and from Gloucester uh, Royal Hospital, who have, uh, who that year in the annual report had a risk adjusted mortality of under 6%. So these are really best practice trusts for um, low mortality rates after emergency laparotomy. And I sat down with the, um, sometimes the surgical lead or the, um, anesthetic lead for NILA and those trusts or the audit lead and asked them what they thought 
uh, were the aspects of their, their practice that might that you might attribute some of these excellent patient outcomes to. And they came up with a number of different um, uh, ideas and thoughts about where their best practice came from. And that's di uh, highlighted in this uh, bulletin article. And it's January 2021. If you want to, to look that up, that should be freely available on the college website. But what they said is they use their data. Uh, all of those sites that have um, excellent mortality figures were regularly looking at their data and um, and taking that back to their clinical colleagues and management colleagues to to really understand how they um, how they were doing. So one trust said we hold regular quality improvement meetings where we present the data. So in a in a multidisciplinary group that really encourages colleagues to fully engage uh, in the emergency laparotomies, especially when it's out of ours um, to to have that understanding that your um, your practice and your uh, your processes really impact on mortality was they felt very important. Um, another trust, we've got regular meetings with all of our leads looking at data collection and results together. And then uh, the other thing to note is the, the EPOC study, which was a very large um, national study looking at practice in emergency laparotomy that published a few years ago. They did a separate ethnographic study, so looking at the practice of teams. And they said that teams are really positive about the benefits of review, reviewing their data together but that the time that they had to do that was a key barrier to improvement. So looking at the data together in teams was really positive, not just for the performance of those teams, but in bringing the team together cohesively and sharing goals together, but that they felt that time, that all teams, as we all know, felt that time was a real barrier to um, uh, uh, to making that happen more regularly. And so what we wanted to do, Neela, was to give you the, the data, you collect the data, so you, you, you absolutely must look at it and use it because you've done all the hard work in collecting the data, but that using that data in a way for us to make it as easy as possible for you to lay your hands on the important data and share that uh, with your colleagues and understand how you're doing. So your job is to collect the data. Our job is to make that data very easy for you to take back in an understandable form to your colleagues. Um, and another important aspect there on what we're talking about, audit and feedback, is how you do it well. So this um, uh, Cochrane review, we're all very familiar with Cochrane review, looked at the best practice in audit and feedback. So what features of audit and feedback did people um, uh, get the best result, the best improvement in practice uh, when they, when they uh, adopted particular practices? And they find that audit and feedback is most effective when, firstly, Obviously, if someone's starting from a low starting point, then they saw the most improvement when they got audit feedback. So that's understanding that there was improvements that needed to be made. Secondly, that the person responsible for the feedback is a supervisor or a colleague. So that is not someone very distant or not an automatic, automatic email. That's someone who's, who's connected, a colleague or, or a superior, perhaps. That that feedback is provided more than once, um, verbally and in writing, so in many different formats. And that that feedback should include a clear target or an action plan uh, at how someone might improve their performance. So just keep in mind some of those aspects of good feedback performance as we go through, because I hope that you'll be able to bring that into the way you look and share your data with colleagues uh, to best effect. So we hope that the, the NILA QI dashboards will provide you that kind of time saving help to um, uh, to let you use your data properly. So uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but just to show you, this is where the dashboards are. We've got some uh, posters, um, pre-formatted posters that will take your data and present it in a poster format that's easy to share with your colleagues. Um, so if you look at that, that poster there, you, you click on that tab, you fill in the date, and the time, uh, or sorry, the date and your name, and you can uh, add a specific area of focus. So again, giving your colleagues the kind of targets that they might need. Uh, and then that produces this, uh, I've, I've grayed out um, the, the hospital involved here, but that takes a kind of pre-formatted poster that's got some uh, nice infographic details on it and draws your own NILA data into that in a way that you can either print it out and share it, 
uh, in your department or in the coffee room or something like that. Um, or you could send it to colleagues via email or, or um, uh, um, as say, for example, give it to people as part of their um, appraisals and so on, so that you can share that data in a number of different ways, really with kind of two or three, two or three clicks um, on the NILA web page. So this hopefully addresses that um, that you're a colleague. It's easy to do it as a, a um, as a colleague, as a NILA lead to others. That you can provide this uh, via email, you can stick it up on the wall. This is a, a kind of written version and because there's an editable section where you can include a target or an action plan for the next month, it hopefully addresses that part of uh, the most effective audit practice as well. So our top tips is to share this with the whole MDT, so for example in coffee rooms, in the operating theatre as well as via email. Um, complete your details on the a little pro forma because that gives someone someone they can come back to it and, and gives them a nice uh, contact if they have any good ideas, for example, or any um, uh, any ideas for action plans. So the way we've used this locally, we print that out, share it with people and say, OK, so our, our results are pretty good. But what we're not doing so well at, at the moment is um, reducing the time it takes for someone to have antibiotics if they've got sepsis. So as a reminder, this is how you that, you know, this is the kind of antibiotics that we give uh, prophylactically for emergency laparotomy. So we put that little detail in there so that people understand the performance and they get the uh, target for action at the same time. And that's the most effective way to do to share that information to change practice. Something else that teams uh, have found very helpful is to have joint M&M &M meetings to discuss cases. Um, and you could do that with a single case or you could do that with a number of, of cases. And it is one of the NILA recommendations that teams get together regularly to uh, discuss um, uh, the laparotomy pathway. So that might be with your emergency department, with your radiologists, uh, anaesthetists and surgeons, of course, and with your critical care teams uh, would, would be the, the main groups to include. Um, also, uh, care of the elderly physicians, if you're looking um, at the, the part of the pathway for um, um, post-operative care of the elderly review for older patients as well. So it's really helpful to bring people together into a room to look at your data together, perhaps discuss a, a case example and then um, build uh, better pathways and better relationships um, using that as the kind of um, uh, using the M&M &M meeting as a, as a vehicle for that. And the NILA web page will, um, or the NILA web tool will help you uh, to create reports. Um, if you look on our reports tab at the bottom, there's a thing called Excellent, Excellence and Exception Reporting. And that is a, a Excel spreadsheet with a macro. So sometimes NHS computers don't like macros because they they see them as bugs, but most hospitals you should be able to download that. And then you just download a copy of your um, clinical data, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Stick it into this um, uh, Excel spreadsheet, and it generates for you a really nice summary of um, your, your, firstly, an excellence report. So an example of all your patients who have had the key standards of care met during their pathway. So you can also you know, learn from excellence um, as well as learning from times when care wasn't so good. And then your exception report at the moment details the care for all the higher risk patients. So that is the patient with a calculated risk of death of higher than 5%. Um, and details whether they've met the key standard of care across the pathway. So you can you can see um, this uh, kind of summary slide here shows whether patients had a CT scan or not, whether they've been looked after by a consultant or not, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so this creates a little database that's very easy for, for people to look at um, and will include mortality reporting in the in the near future so that you can have a list of your patients who, who have died. Um, and that's extremely helpful for for running morbidity and mortality meetings to look for any common themes that occur across these pathways. 
Uh, that's just another highlight of the exception report. So uh, the previous page, an excellent report of everyone who met the standards. And you can see here when a, when a key clinical standard hasn't been met for those patients, that is highlighted in red. And for those of you that are using the best practice tariff, this view also tells you who has met the best practice tariff and who has not, if that's something that your trust uh, is working towards if you're in England. Um, I mentioned uh, collecting, uh, looking at all of your patients' uh, data. In fact, you can download the full NILA data set if you're um, an Excel guru. There's lots of things you can do with that data set yourself, aside from what we do in the um, in the NILA QI web tools. And um, whilst a lot of the national clinical audits, once you put your data into the audit, it disappears for good. I think a really important part of NILA in comparison to other national audits is that data is still there for you in real time um, uh, to use locally as well as uh, contribute to the national report. So if you go on to the second tab, clinical, and go on to export, you come up with this view here and you've got a whole lot of different choices there. So the first one's the NILA pro forma, give you different versions of the same thing, which is the whole NILA data set, either with different field names or, or in text or in writing. Um, the NILA pro forma PID stands for uh, patient identifiable data, and that gives you, so the, the, the first couple of pro formas give you, um, don't give you any patient details because uh, just for data security, it's better that way. But if you do need patient details, then you can download that um, patient identifiable data form, which will give you the patient's uh, name and hospital number and NHS number as well. Um, if you're if you work in a trust that your com colleagues write comments as they uh, fill in, it, they can fill in comments by the um, uh, by the answer field when they're filling in the NILA data set. If, so you can look at the comments with another download there. Um, you, you have an option here to download this either as a, as a zip file with a, um, with password protection, and that's the best way to make sure this data stays secure and is protected. Um, do be wary if you download this onto, say, for example, a trust computer that some of this data doesn't sit in the download box of the trust computer because it is um, a lot of patient identifiable data available in some of these reports. And um, uh, it would be wrong for me to encourage you to, to leave that lying around on trust computers. So it is um, important confidential information, but you can download it with a, with, in a password protected version just to keep yourself on the right side if you're a Caldecott Guardian. Um, when, when you download this, it, it, it might seem that the headings uh, are, are a little bit, some of them are foreshortened words, for example, or some of them are codes. The NILA um, clinical audit export key. So if you go to the support tab and look at the clinical audit export key, that will give you the, the kind of detail that's behind that. So for example, on one version, if you download it, the mortality, a died in hospital has got the code zero, uh, survived hospital has got the code one and so on. So it gives you uh, the key for all of these different codes if you've downloaded the, the coded version there. So if you download something and it looks like gobbledygook, you can use the clinical audit export key to translate that back into English for you. So um, moving on then just quickly to the NILA QI dashboard. Um, the, the QI dashboard covers many different standards and it covers um, them in a range of, using a range of different data visualization tools, histograms, Pareto charts, if you, uh, run charts and SPC charts. If you're someone who's done a little bit of uh, improvement, these are important charts to use uh, as part of improvement methods. All of the the charts that I'm going to show you are downloadable either as a PDF or as a JPEG, for example, to insert into presentations or into, into emails to colleagues. You can look at indications for surgery or the types of procedures done, um, interesting for um, uh, surgical presentations. And you can also look at uh, sort of very uh, descriptive patient tools like their uh, range of ages, range of ASA grades, the urgency a range of high risk and low risk. Um, and all of these dashboards also come with real time, national, regional and size comparisons. So we've taken all the participants into NILA 
and roughly divided you into one of four quartiles based on the number of beds in the hospital so that you can see, for example, we know that the larger hospitals struggle with the um, uh, uh, admissions critical care more than smaller hospitals do. So you can compare yourself like to like whether you're looking at other people in the region or uh, other hospitals of the same size as you. And you can toggle all of these data fields off and on because as you can imagine, if you're if you've got all of the displays all of the time, the the chart can be quite confusing. So you can toggle data off and on. Maybe you don't want a regional comparison. Maybe you don't want a national comparison. Um, so that your chart looks nice and clean to share with colleagues and get your message across. So looking down on the uh, various things available to you on the dashboard, if you look on reports, you get this long uh, list of possible reports. Um, you can look as a Neela lead at your data entry and incomplete records is really helpful to, to chase up colleagues who've maybe started a record and it's not finished yet or to keep an eye on whether your data entries um, maybe sometimes falls off in August and September when you get some new registrars arriving who might not have uh, passwords, for example. Um, we've got also got hospital reports and if you're in England, AHSN reports. So that's a regional report and that gives you a, a pro forma of, uh, of your a summary of your performance over the previous uh, either the, either for a year's worth of data or a quarter's worth of data as a PDF. Um, and then we've also got these patients, the all of these various dashboards looking at the key standards of care. And I'll go through some of these quite quickly and I'll ask Peter to go through Yuma's later on. So um, here's an example of the indication for surgery um, uh, 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 chart. Um, and as you can see, you've got a range of different histograms looking at your performance versus national uh, and regional performance. Um, and then the Pareto part is um, a cumulative figure uh, looking to see which of these um, different um, indications for surgery contribute most to your practice. So um, uh, this, uh, this is another dashboard. We've two of our dashboards, the patient level data uh, uh, is available on the time it takes to get to the operating theatre and for length of stay. So as well as seeing an average, for example, month by month, you can look at the purple dots, which are patient level data, which might tell you if you've got any outliers there. So particularly for length of stay, we know is so related to complications. You might, for example, want to look at length of stay for those that have stayed a very long time and then do some more um, deep dives into those patients and see why their length of stay was so long. Perhaps it was a delay to theatre, perhaps it was a delay in physiotherapy or or um, perhaps it was a specific surgical indication that means that these patients have a longer length of stay. But the data will show you any outliers there um, that you can look on in detail. So when you see this on your dashboard, you can toggle on or off the patients, the purple dots. And if you want to know who an exact patient is, if you hover your uh, cursor over that patient, it'll give you the NILA ID. So you can go back and look at that patient in the data set to understand a little bit more about how they got the length of stay that they did. You can stratify most of these dashboards in a number of different ways. So you can look at the different NC pod levels of urgency. So perhaps um, maybe all of your patients needing to come to, to theatres uh, immediately. So within two hours, perhaps you want to look at that cohort separately. You can stratify according to age. So particularly NILA standards relating to older patients or indeed to frail patients. So you can stratify by looking at just the patients with a fr clinical frailty score of over five to see if there's any difference in outcomes for those patients, particularly length of stay. It's also available for you to turn some of this on and off looking at sepsis patients. So the definition we have of sepsis for this data set is you either have uh, sepsis suspected on admission or coming to theatres, or if you have a diagnosis which is um, uh, commonly associated with sepsis, for example, um, peritonitis or uh, perforation. And so you could uh, start to really understand 
how different patients in your cohorts uh, experience their outcomes. Um, is your length of stay for frail patients much longer than patients who aren't frail? Maybe this gives you an indication to get more uh, input from care of the elderly physicians uh, and so on and so forth. You can use the data to help you with, with that. Looking at a little bit more detail in sepsis, this will be, uh, I'm not going to give you too much of a spoiler alert on the annual report or um, my colleagues would kill me, but it will be a focus for us in the future to look at sepsis because some of the, as we know from the, and I'd, I'd ask you to look at the NILA webinar we did on sepsis last year, some of this data hasn't improved as much as some of the other data and a, a number of NILA patients don't get antibiotics within the correct time frame um, uh, as recommended by the, the sepsis trust of these urgent antibiotics. So this dashboard lets you look at that in detail. So the patients, uh, the, the blue patients above the line are the patients that did have antibiotics in the right time frame and the patients below the line are the patients who do not have antibiotics given to them um, uh, within an hour of admission if they had uh, sepsis uh, suspected on admission. And this is the kind of chart that you can share with your trust sepsis lead or with your ED um, just to understand a little bit more about uh, our performance in this area and how um, uh, how it's affecting some of them in their further journeys. At the bottom of this chart, there's a list of the NILA ID numbers of the patients who don't have antibiotics in, this, in a suitable time frame. So again, you can take this part of the dashboard and use it to go back to look at those patients in more detail if you want to say, for example, use that as part of an M&M &M meeting or, or deep dive audit into, into this area. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, uh, Peter. I think you're going to share your slides, Peter. Let me stop sharing. Um, and I see we've had some questions already. Peter and I will address them at the end of the, um, of the webinar, but I'll hand you over to Peter now, who's going to talk to us about UMAS. Thanks, Peter. Uh, hi, thanks very much, Colin. Um, uh, and hello to everyone. So I'm here to talk specifically about just one aspect of uh, the dashboard, about the uh, so-called exponentially weighted moving average charts, which in NILA we've taken to call uh, UMA charts um, for the acronym. Um, so first of all, why are we considering them? If you've looked at an annual NILA report, you might have seen um, this uh, funnel plot. Um, so this shows on the vertical axis, the adjusted 30-day mortality rate uh, based on uh, death registration data, as well as data that uh, hospitals have submitted to us. Um, and then on the horizontal axis, it shows how many operations a hospital has done uh, in one audit year. And each black dot is a hospital. And so hospitals that uh, have a relatively high mortality rate will be uh, towards the top of the chart. And those that have a relatively low mortality rate, such as those that uh, Carla mentioned earlier, uh, uh, whose um, whose whose uh, clinical team she interviewed uh, for her uh, bulletin article, they'll be at the uh, towards the bottom end of the chart. Um, and these uh, the the red line is the uh, the average mortality uh, in that year. So that was um, the report from 2019. So that was the actual the audit year was 2018 approximately. So at that time it was just over nine percent. That's the red line. Uh, and then around that are drawn what are called control limits uh, to um, uh, give uh, some indication of the statistical variation uh, just through good luck or bad luck uh, that we might expect um, around the national average. So as long as um, hospitals are lying within these uh, the stashed lines, uh, generally we think um, they uh, could be regarded as having a mortality rate um, after risk adjustment that is about the national average. Um, 
but if if hospitals such as these three here uh, are above um the control limit so this is the um so called 95% control limit and um then uh, this is is a, regarded as a statistical signal that they might have a raised mortality rate it's not a proof in its in itself because it could still be due to statistical variation but the control limits are uh the kind of decision rule to uh, allow us to say um to give some sort of you know a uh, criterion for saying well if you're above that then you might need to uh, check whether something is going on and uh, as you might know if you're involved in in NILA data collection and reading NILA reports so hospitals that are above the control limit um they uh, may be named in the in the report um so in fact if you're above the pointed line you're um uh, you're named in the report and if you're twice in three years above the uh, the dashed line then you're also named in the report um so these uh, um being being an outlier should be an incentive to uh, check your data you know have we actually submitted all our patients uh, have we submitted the right information uh, and if you have and uh, uh, after any corrections, you're still an outlier, it should be an incentive to um, uh, check what's going on, whether there's actually any any processes in the hospitals that could explain why uh, more patients might have died than might have needed to die. Um, the problem with the funnel plot is that it comes very late. So the NILA report in past years typically came um, almost a year after the last uh, patient had an operation who is included in the information uh, in this chart. Uh, so um, essentially at the time hospitals get this information, the data are between one and two years old. Um, and that's not very helpful because you then need to review historical cases um, that might have happened a long time ago, maybe involving members of staff that aren't even working at your place anymore. Um, so, um, and also if there's actually a problem uh, in, um, in a hospital, then obviously you're detecting it quite late. Um, you're detecting it between one and two years uh, after it was actually present. So it makes it more difficult to do something about it. And it might mean that it persisted for a long time. So those are the reasons why we want to have a, a real time uh, um, monitoring process for mortality. And this is what this chart is, uh, which I'm going to exp um, explain next. So these charts have been, um, they're called exponentially weighted moving average charts. Uh, we have not invented them. They're, they're, they're uh, established in several areas of uh, life, including industrial process control, but also in um, uh, in uh, medicine and in health, uh, in health systems, so in uh, monitoring um, outcomes from uh, hospitals and other health um, services. So, what does this chart show? Uh, again, on the vertical axis, it shows um, thirty-day in-hospital mortality. Thirty-day mortality. In, in this case, it's in-hospital mortality. So we're only taking to account information that uh, hospitals themselves have um, transmitted to us. Uh, we, we, um, because it's a real-time. Uh, it's intended to be a real-time chart. We're not waiting for official death registration information. So it's only taken to account patients, uh, what happens to a patient within the hospital, not what happens to them after they are discharged. Um, again, the, the gray line in this case is uh, the, the, the national average mortality as it was when we uh, developed these charts, uh, um, a little over 9%. And then we're tracking um, two things uh, with this chart. So there's the red line, and that tracks um, the observed mortality rate. Now, so um, without going into the calculation exactly how it's tracked, uh, but you can think of it as an estimate at each point in time of um, 
your current mortality rate in your hospital. So for example, if you were looking at um, this point in time, which is, uh, if you look at the time axis, um, late September, early October um, uh, 2019 in this case, your observed mortality is estimated by this chart to be around 12%. Um, this is the actual, this is not in itself risk adjusted. So the red line is just tracking what proportion of patients uh, uh, are currently um, surviving and dying after emergency laparotomy. The risk adjustment is, however, in the chart and it's represented by the blue line. So the blue line tracks the average risks of the patients that, um, uh, that um, whose data you've put into the system. So um, in an average hospital, the average risk should be about the average um, um, the average mortality rate. Uh, but of course, it can vary between different hospitals if the case mix uh, differs. So uh, you might know this, but uh, just to say, so this risk adjustment comes from a statistical model that was developed um, uh, a few years ago, published in 2018, um, which takes into account uh, things like patient age, patient age, the ASA grade, uh, and results from blood measurements, the urgency of op operation, uh, whether they have uh, cancer or not, uh, uh, and other things. Altogether, about 20 variables. Uh, and so um, the uh, what you can do with this chart is you can compare the observed mortalities, so the red line, to the expected or predicted mortalities, so the blue line. So in, in a sense, on average, if things are going um, if things are going well, then the red line should be about uh, uh, at about the level of the blue line. That would indicate that, um, well, the, 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 um, the patient deaths are about as likely as predicted by the model, which hopefully means that um, uh, care is going well for the patients. Now, if the observed mortality, so the red line is a lot uh, above the blue line, that you might, you might think that there might be um, a cause for concern. Uh, however, of course, uh, because uh, life um, contains um, many, um, well, unforeseen uh, uh, events that are not in, it, in themselves in, um, accounted for in the risk model. So of course the lines will rarely exactly match. So a little bit of variation of the red line around the blue line is uh, entirely expected and uh, um, not necessarily a cause for concern. And that's why in this chart, like in the funnel plot, we have put control limits around the prediction. So in this case, the control limits are um, indicated by this blue cloud. So um, uh, this gives you a kind of an indication of um, uh, how much uh, variation in the observed mortality rate around the prediction you can think of as uh, just um, statistically to be expected random variation. If, however, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to the slides I just skipped, if, however, the red line exceeds the, uh, the cloud, so goes above the um, blue cloud, uh, apologies, um, this, is, this is really a sign that um, you want to start looking at your data uh, a bit more closely and check what's going on. So uh, it's, a it's a warning system in order to uh, alert you to the fact that uh, you might want to investigate um, why your data appear to show that um, there are more deaths than expected. So this is a, this is a real time monitoring system. It takes into account only the information you enter into the NIDA web tool. Um, uh, initially, uh, only locked cases, although you can actually toggle to see, to include unlocked cases as well. Um, it uses the published risk adjustment model, as I've said, to uh, predict 30-day uh, mortality for each patient. And then the in-hospital deaths are used to calculate the current estimate of observed mortality rate. and then. Here's a reference also for this particular uh, 
chart um, version of the chart that I've used. So it's um, uh, it track the, the, this chart tracks in real time. So as you put in the data, um, as soon as you lock a case, um, that will appear. Uh, uh, the, the inf um, that will extend the chart. Um, and so that information will be included in the chart. Um, so in that sense, it's in real time as data are put in. And so it gives you the chance to, if there is indeed a problem, to detect problems sooner. So just to give you an example, when, when um, hospitals are actually identified in outliers by our funnel plot, which we do for the annual reports. We, we write to the, these hospitals before the report is published. So we give them a chance to, um, to check, uh, to, to respond to the fact that they're an outlier and to check their data. And it happens more often than not that actually uh, when they check their data, they realize, oh, we, we failed to submit some patients or we, uh, we didn't put some of the risk information incorrectly. And after they revise the data, then they are not an outlier anymore. Um, so uh, that's of course then pretty late and they do it at uh, under time pressure and with the threat of being named an outlier hanging over them. Uh, it'll, you know, it's much nicer to do this when you detect it yourself uh, in a timely fashion and you can straight away address the problem. So these humors are not themselves part part of the formal outlier policy. So that's important to note. So you're not going to, uh, nobody's going to name you publicly or anything if, uh, if the chart signals, so if you're, if you, um, if the red line goes outside the control limits, but the chance for hospitals, for clinical teams to take action themselves early on um, to detect problems and then potentially address them. Um, so, just to just to make clear what I'm talking about. So if you if you've reached like the 28th of November 2019 and you now enter a new patient who may be there whose operation date was uh, the 29th of November, this chart will grow to the right. So it'll keep growing um, as long as you put in new patients. Uh, and so this line might then go down or might up might go up again. Every time a patient dies, it will go up by a little bit, and every time a patient uh, is recorded as having been discharged alive, the line will go down a little bit. So um, how how can you, oh, so what should you actually do? Or how should you view the fact that uh, when you observe that your chart exceeds um, uh, the control limit? So the first thing to say is um, don't panic. It, it, the chart exceeding the control limit itself is not proof that something is going wrong. Um, uh, for, so first of all, false alarms are inevitable. If you run a system such as this for long enough over a sufficient number of hospitals, um, <clears throat> false alarms are inevitable. Um, you, you cannot avoid them if you have a statistic, if you have a purely statistical uh, control system like that. Uh, but of course, um, uh, it's not the case that you should just assume that uh, a signal like that is a false alarm. Um, so the recommendation is um, to view uh, getting an, an alert like this as an opportunity to investigate what's going on. So as a nudge to investigate and to do it uh, and to uh, make a some sort of to check as to check different possibilities of what might be going on according to this uh, pyramid model uh, where going from the bottom to the top so the first thing you would check is are my data actually correct uh, you know have i have i put in all patients you know especially have i if i if you only put in patients who died and didn't put in uh, data in data about the patients who didn't die then of course your chart that only sees the deaths and not the survivals will uh, signal to you that lots of people died. So that wouldn't be a surprise. Uh, another common thing is not to put in risk factor information correctly. So for example, uh, the ASA grade, the default option in the web form is uh, grade one or two, I think. Uh, and sometimes people forget to actually uh, 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 tick the appropriate box and just leave uh, that information as the default, which 
then makes it look as if you have operated on lots of low risk patient, even if that might not actually be true. So first you check whether your data are accurate and that can obviously take some time. And then you might check case mix. Um, so is there something unusual about um, the patients you've operated on recently? Uh, we are, of course, or the, 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 the charts are trying to account for that using the NILA risk model um, so that it, there is a risk adjustment already for case mix, but you might have, uh, you might have other considerations uh, about um, characteristics of your patients that might not have might not be uh, taken into account in, in the risk model that might lead you to uh, think about that, that this could be a reason for um, a higher mortality rate. Of course, then it would need to be a plausible explanation. And only if you've ruled out, out these two things. So if you think, well, no, our data are correct. We don't really have any reason to suspect that our patients are any different after risk adjustment from other hospitals, then you'd look at whether there's something about your hospital structures, your clinical processes, and finally, maybe individual clinicians um, uh, that could be an explanation for a, a raised mortality rate. So you don't start by blaming anyone or um, or getting uh, or panicking. You start by, first of all, finding out, well, um, you know, ruling out some obvious and frequent explanations for, um, for uh, such alarms. So how do you how do you um, how do you find your 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 exponentially weighted moving average charts? Well, you go into NILA reports, and there is then uh, there is a um, um, a tab uh, for EWMA um, with which you access it, and then it looks like this. Uh, so it looks a bit different than on the. Uh, the charts uh, are made earlier, but it's the same principle. So in this case, the black line is the the observed mortality rate, and the blue line is the prediction, and the gray cloud is the margin of error uh, around the prediction. Uh, this is uh, obviously not a real hospital, but uh, these are dummy data. You um, uh, by default, the chart will be based on locked. Uh, cases only, so where you've entered them in the database and blocked them such to signal this is a complete record. Um, uh, you can also, there's a little button here at the top under the date range to include unlocked cases. You can toggle that uh, and then click refresh to update the chart and include unlocked cases as well if that's what you want to look at. Um, you can also, if you hover your mouse over um, over these lines, you can reveal exactly the data points. So for example, uh, uh, in this case, uh, a patient has um, uh, just died. So the observed mortality rate has gone up. You can see what the observed mortality rate is at that point, 7.6. And you can also see the exact date, which might give you an indication about which patient this is. Um, we have, Produce documentation, quite detailed documentation, to explain uh, how a UMA, how how this uh, chart works, so uh, how it's defined um, and how to interpret it, um, and also what to do when you're investigating unusual results. Uh, um, by unusual results, I mean if the mortality rate um, rises above the control limits. Um, I recommend them uh, to you, so they're available um, via this link. Um, and maybe the the uh, the final thing to say before I stop is that what we also have implemented now uh, in the case where one hospital's uh, chart does exceed the control limit, we have an automated email that alerts, uh, I believe, the clinical um, uh, the clinical lead, the NILA lead uh, of that hospital to the fact that there is the signal. So again, this is not part of an official outlier process. We're not telling anyone else. This is just a nudge for uh, for the near lead to say, well, you might want to and you sh probably should look at your data. Um, so, uh, and we might uh, then uh, as a near team engage in further communication uh, with that, um, uh, around that um, with you. Uh, well, these are references I've used to make this talk, and um, 
I think I should stop now to leave time for questions. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'll just turn my camera off and on again. There we are. Thank you, Peter. We've got a few questions here um, and I'll, I'll take some of them in turn. So, uh, uh, and please do add your questions in the question tab if you have any questions from myself and Peter over the next 10 minutes or so. Um, so the first question from Leslie, in Bradford, we've been highlighted as outliers in mortality and looking at the last 10 deaths, but no missed opportunities. The gap between predicted and actual mortality is growing. The weighting of ASA status in predicted mortality may be a factor. This should be an objective score, but my concern is that it's subjective and open to interpretation. I wonder if this was removed from the prediction model and a more robust tool was used, the figure would look different. Um, I have some comments there, but do you have any comments, Peter? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, do, do um, should I start? Or? Yes, please do. So, so first of all, to say, yeah, uh, so it's entirely correct. So the ASA status is part of the risk prediction model uh, and it is quite influential um, uh, in the sense that it, it, if, if you code someone, well, if you classify someone as level three or level four or grade three or grade four, it does actually make a big difference. Um, uh, and the fact that it does make a big difference, um, although, um, and maybe Carolyn will say about that, how, how subjective or objective it is. But the fact that it does make a big difference does also signal that it does actually relate to something real because it does predict who dies, even after taking into account lots of other uh, more objective information, such as uh, blood tests and so forth. Um, so uh, taking it out of the official model, I don't think we'll consider that. Um, uh, but th th there might be a, uh, Carla might say about this, but there might be a conversation to be had is uh, about criteria for, um, well, grading patients in that respect. Yes, that's right. Um, <clears throat> and it's a very difficult issue, isn't it? Because obviously the data out depends on the data in. But I think there's a couple of points to make. The, the most important thing is that the patients are getting the right kind of care. So I think that... Um, You've done exactly the right thing, looking into your death in a little bit more detail and trying to understand the background there is exactly what we want to happen early on. Um, and you mentioned that ASA is perhaps a little bit open to interpretation. You're, you're right, it is. The, the, the criteria for ASA are pretty clearly written down, but I think those of us as clinicians that do ASA every day might um, uh, have a little bit of custom and practice that we interpret it differently. So for example, strictly by the books, if you're a smoker or if you've got a high BMI, that makes you an ASA too, even if you've got no other comorbidities, which in some people's minds would make you an ASA one. So there is some interpretation there. So my advice on that would be to make sure that the ASA criteria are very clearly noted for your colleagues. And it might seem a little bit like teaching your granny to suck eggs, but it is important, isn't it? to make sure that these criteria are clear. The second thing I would say is in NILA, we're struggling all the time to try to minimize the amount of data that you have to collect. And that might be causing you to shout at your computer as you hear it. But trust me, we try to take as many things out of the data set as we can. And so to replace something really simple like ASA with something more complex that might describe a little bit more about someone's background or, or a little bit more detail about cardiorespiratory fitness or something like that would necessitate a, a much bigger data set. And we definitely don't want to do that. So ASA, whilst imperfect, is quite a handy little um, short way of talking about people's backgrounds. And of course, it's been validated for a great many years and it's very well known. The last thing I would say about that is definitely look at how you're entering and how other people are entering the data. But there is actually a tab on the dashboard which shows you your ASA breakdown in comparison to the national breakdown. And that might be very helpful for you, Leslie, if you go into the the um, uh, patient's um, I think it's called patient indicators. Uh, you'll find it on the on the reports tab. It shows you how many patients you have in each ASA category and what your comparison to the regional and national targets are there. So that might help you to answer a little bit more about whether you suspect your colleagues are under or overscoring patients or not. But what I would say in summary is that you're doing exactly the right thing. You're looking at your data in detail and trying to understand that performance. 
Um, and then um, Ben, hello Ben, used to work with Ben, has got a question about uh, working at trust with two sites. Are we able to show the infographic report for cross-site data or only individual sites? And so I checked with Christine, our fantastic project manager, and she um, says that that data is available just for individual sites. So I suggest what you'd need to do, Ben, is to kind of put both of those charts side by side. O on the top, you can toggle between them. So I can look at, for example, the test hospital and my hospital, St. George's. Um, so at the top of the dashboard, it asks you which hospital you want your data for. If you're the lead across several sites, you'll have the opportunity to change that. If, if, if you only work in one site, you obviously can't change your data to see other hospital sites. So unfortunately, you can't show it on the same tab, but you can toggle between the different hospitals there. Um, and then Elizabeth asked a question, is it possible to make the target on the poster more obvious? Uh, we can certainly take that back, Elizabeth. We have been looking at the poster recently because some people had comments on the colouring there. Um, uh, so um, we can definitely take that back to the project team to make that target larger because uh, because it is important. Um, and then Nabil says, unfortunately, my hospital length of stay is high mainly because of social reasons rather than complications. How can we reflect that on Nila? Um, I'm sorry, Nabil, that you can't reflect that on Nila. But what I would say about length of stay is, although we measure that and and share that, it's not some, something that you're that you're judged against with your with your um, against your peers. You're not an uh, you're not recorded anywhere as an outlier on length of stay. That information is there because it's important to patients. It doesn't reflect necessarily that they have that they have bad care. It's an outcome that patients are interested in. If you feel that your length of stay is high because of social reasons, then that's an important thing to take back to your trust and for them to to um, agree with social care uh, where the where the gaps are and where the improvements might be. And looking at your local data compared to national data might be quite powerful to help you make that case with external partners. Uh, and then Wing Mong has said, there's still a lot of incomplete data entries in our hospital, although we keep sending reminders. What should I do? Oh, that's the eternal struggle of the NILA lead. And I can smile about it because I'm not my local NILA lead anymore. It can be very difficult when I think that sharing the data regularly and letting people see the output of their data is really important because if people are just putting data in and they don't see any communication or output from that, then why would they continue to do that for you? So I think using the data in audit meetings and so on is really helping to build some interest and engagement. We have done a couple of different um, sort of case vignettes and little studies looking at data collection and they are um, mentioned in some of the previous annual reports. So in the in the, the NILA annual reports, there's little cutout vignettes or improvement windows, and we have covered um, data collection and case ascertainment in that uh, in a bit of detail. But in short, I would make sure everyone has a password, make sure you cover it with new trainees when they come into the trust as part of induction. Look at when that data gets filled in. So are you filling it in in the operating theatre or are you filling it in uh, at the time of booking and so on? Um, and, and really try to facilitate that. I do know a NILA lead somewhere that used to leave a Mars bar in the pigeonhole of anyone that filled in their NILA data. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a, a good solution for you, but it's, it seemed to work in that trust. But there's lots of summaries of how to get it, how to improve your um, case ascertainment in the previous annual report. So I would look up those first. Uh, Dimitrios says, thank you for a useful presentation. We know time is a crucial factor as far as care results and mortality. Is there a way to look at more detail time-wise from NILA data as far as different stages of the trip? Patient admission, time of assessment, time of imaging, time of decision-making, time of arrival into theatres. Um, I've got some comments on that, but I don't know if you have any comments too, Peter. Well, we are measuring all these things. I'm not quite sure. So, and we're reporting on them. I'm not quite sure what the question is, whether 
Yes, I suppose Dimitros is saying that because the time is so important and you're absolutely right, is there any way that we can display this a little bit more? So it, it it's always there as part of the annual report and timeliness to theatre is one of the dashboard tables there, but the other uh, times from admission and so on aren't included in the dashboard. We find that when we looked at it as a NILA team that some of those data fields aren't um, the the they're not filled in particularly accurately and they're quite often omitted because they're not a mandatory field. Um, and so we we do have some concerns about the accuracy of that data is recorded uh, on a national level. However, if you find that, that this data is recorded well locally and you want to look into it in a bit more detail, I would suggest that you use the export tab and you can look at those data fields um, as part of the, the big Excel spreadsheet of the whole data set and, and do a little bit of wizardry on it that way. Um, it, what you might also encourage colleagues to do is that comments field as you fill in the NILA data, if they know there's any specific factors at play there, they could, for example, enter it into that field and that would give you a really rich data set to work from in the future. But that's something we can take back to the project team and look if another tab on timeliness might be a useful addition to the, to the dashboard. Um, I'm just going to take the last uh, questions here. Um, uh, looks like Peter's typing an answer for Andy on how his um, how the UMA correlates with 30 day mortality. And I'll take Elizabeth's question. When the decision to operate is made, the blood pressure may be supported with vasopressors. You cannot say if this is a case. I expect the NILA risk would be higher if unsupported blood pressure is added. Um, Thank you, Elizabeth. I think you think you're right. So, and also with the tab that looks at uh, anemia, you know, you might find that a patient's um, uh, uh, hemoglobin looks really high, but they're just post transfusion, and that's not collected in the data set. What I would say is, overall, we know that the NILA risk correlates extremely accurately with mortality because that's how it's been developed, and the the um, the correlation between the NILA risk score pre-op and the mortality is um, is really very close. It's it's as accurate as you'd want it to be across all levels of risk, across the low risk and the high risk patients. Uh, unlike unlike PPOSM, that is quite inaccurate when you get onto the higher risk patients. So, if there are some patients for whom that risk doesn't work accurately because, um, for example, their blood pressure reading is misleading, then um, this is sort of cancelled out when we look at across the whole data set. So you might want to comment on that when you're talking to an individual patient about risk. But when we look across the whole data set and we're working out people's risk versus their colleagues, which is what the risk adjustment model is, was created for, we know that it's still pretty accurate despite these uh, small numbers of patients who the, the risk calculator may not accurately represent their risk. I suppose just before we leave it is to say that that risk is um, that, that risk is to be taken in the whole. So the NILA risk tool, for example, doesn't include frailty and we know that frailty makes all patients high risk. So it's it's just a number that you should be using as part of a discussion with patients as well as to work out who's got a risk of death of higher than 5%. So who, who might be eligible for, for example, admission to critical care and so on. So um, uh, the number is only part of the answer. Uh, and hopefully if you did know that the number is not accurate because of some other factors at play, that would form part of your discussion with the patient as well. Um, so I'm just going to finish us there. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, your attendance. Um, uh, let me put my finish screen here. Uh, and I just wanted to say, please fill in the feedback forms that come and any ideas you have for future uh, NILA webinars, we'd be very happy to hear them. Um, and just to say that big thank you to Christine Taylor, who's our NILA project manager for her support with this webinar and her expert guidance of the project team. Um, any of you that have contacted uh, NILA for help with anything will know how helpful Christine's been. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for attending. Bye bye. Bye.